Australia, October 1932. As Gandhi began his hunger strike and Hitler circled the chancellorship of Germany, George Pierce, Australia's Minister for Defense, was faced with two questions that would define his career. One, could a group of farmers from Western Australia get their hands on some machine guns? And two, could they shoot them at some emus? Now normally, these weren't questions a defense minister would entertain. But this defense minister, at that moment in time, answered them with a quick and enthusiastic, yes. He would be the first man in history to lead his country in a war against the emu. Thanks so much to Morning Brew for helping bring this history to life. Real quick up top, once again, please welcome our esteemed guest writer for this series from the super fun history podcast, Something True, Duncan Fife. Thanks for bringing the birds, Duncan. Strange as it might sound, until 1932, nobody ever really thought to fire a machine gun at an emu. I know, shocking. In Australia, the big bird even shares pride of place with the kangaroo on the nation's coat of arms. But the farmers of Western Australia's wheat belt soon came to see that heraldry as an insult. For it celebrated a loud, rabble-rousing pest that stomped their wheat, scared their sheep, and burst open holes in fences that let rabbits rush in to do even more damage. Though in fairness, what the emu saw was simply wide open spaces that were supplied with fresh water and plenty of wheat, aka the ideal migratory destination for the enormous avian. But let's take a step back for a minute and look at how these farms grew to be an emu's paradise. After the First World War, Australia made its returning servicemen a deal. See, it was sitting on 24 million acres of land, and it wanted to sell or lease that land to the returning soldiers, setting them up as farmers. One catch, though. That land was awful. The scheme was designed in part to get somebody, anybody really, to settle in and harvest the most desolate parts of a very large country. Unfortunately, there was actually one more deeply disturbing catch. Of approximately 800 Aboriginal men who served in the war, only three had applications approved under the settlement scheme. In fact, some of the land was even taken from Aboriginal reserves. So, if you were an Aboriginal soldier, you actually had a better chance of losing land than gaining it. And you know, that's just something to keep in mind for later if you find yourself having a particular sympathy for men getting humiliated by birds. Just think back to this. But anyway, as we were saying, the land wasn't very good for Western agriculture. In particular, the small towns of Campion and Wagulin, 200 miles from Perth, were the toughest farmland in the country. There, every stalk of wheat that could be grown had to be grown. And not just for the farmer's own sake, because wheat was a major Australian export. It was a tough existence. And then, in 1929, came the Great Depression. Unemployment skyrocketed, and the government offered the wheat farmers a bailout by guaranteeing them a decent price on their crops. But then they went back on their word once the depression worsened. So the wheat farmers were losing their shirts. And despite multiple promises from multiple governments, assistance never came. In fact, they were so mad that they decided, one day in 1932, that Australia would simply have no wheat at all that year. Yeah, they'd rather throw it all away than prop up a government that treated them so poorly. A standoff was coming, and it would have happened, except for one thing. Actually, more like 20,000 things. Emus. 20,000 rowdy emus had just mated and were ready to rumble. Hooting and hollering, they surged west in a feathery tidal wave right for the wheat fields of Campion. Now, if you happen to have never had the displeasure of an emu storming your wheat fields, here is what the farmers saw. The average emu stands six feet tall and stands for nothing. Nothing, of course, but emu survival. They stay on the move in packs, scouring the land for resources like a marauding band of pirates, completely indifferent to the rule of law. And that's what makes them such a dangerous foe. You know, that and that they run incredibly fast, 30 miles an hour to be precise. They're lightweight, tough and muscular, and are equipped with 6-inch razor-sharp claws on their toes, meaning they're deadly in a scrape and poorly suited for most ball sports. They thought the wheat fields were a wonderful prize, plenty to eat, and what they didn't take, they'd get to trample underfoot or poop on. A natural enemy for the farmer. And indeed, emus had terrified the wheat fields for years. And by 1923, farmers had successfully lobbied to have the emu designated as vermin, with the government subsidizing bounties for any hunter bringing home an emu head. But they had never seen emus in numbers like this before. 20,000? That was a national emergency! And the bounty hunters had not signed up to take down that many birds, okay? 
Fences couldn't keep them out, and while the farmers got off a few shots with their rifles, they assuredly weren't going to be able to fend off this foul force with such insignificant firepower. But, being ex-soldiers, they knew where to get some more. One of the most effective weapons of the First World War was the Lewis gun, a light machine gun that shot 550 rounds a minute with an effective range of 880 yards. It was one of the greatest machines of modern warfare, a potent symbol of man's increasing power of destruction, and just the thing to put down a flock of birds. Huh? But to get their hands on these guns, a coalition of Campion wheat farmers made a direct appeal to the Minister of Defense, George Pierce, who was also, importantly, an elected senator for the state of Western Australia. Pierce, like anyone whose career depended on the voters of Western Australia, was very preoccupied with thoughts and fears of secession. Although the federal government of Australia was only 30 years old, the state of Western Australia had for some time been agitating to leave, believing that the state, its people, and their interests would be better served by self-governance. So, the Depression had dealt the state massive economic damage, and this unhappiness fueled an organized secession movement that was fast building toward a referendum on independence. And that was something Pierce was actively campaigning against. Also, Pierce was well aware that the government had failed to give any meaningful financial aid to the wheat farmers of Western Australia after putting them there in the first place. But with this overture from the emu distressed farmers, he saw that what he could offer and what might earn him just as much political goodwill as money was a really big gun to shoot some emus and save a union. And if nothing else, remember this, because it's an important lesson in the workings of democracy. If there are enough votes in it, the government will let you kill any bird you want. Now, Pierce had no way of knowing if it would be effective to turn weapons of war on a rampaging horde of emus. I mean, it had never been tried before, and a machine gun is not the emu's natural predator after all. But given the opportunity, Pierce was eager to provide a show of force, a dramatic and undeniable demonstration of his party's friendship with the good, hard-working constituents of Western Australia. Although he wasn't going to pay for it. So here's the deal Pierce struck. The farmers could have the benefit of two machine guns, but those guns could only be used by soldiers from the Royal Australian Artillery. The state government would have to pay for the transport of those guns, and the farmers had to arrange for the soldiers' accommodation and food. Meaning, it was an official military operation at a price, but one the farmers were willing to pay. The emus, by contrast, unfortunately weren't able to earn or really understand the concept of money, which did put them at a significant disadvantage in the brewing conflict. Pierce sent the farmers of Campion two Lewis guns with 10,000 rounds of ammunition, and those guns were under the command of Major Gwyneth Meredith, who was supported by two other soldiers, McMurray and O'Halloran, plus, usually, a cinematographer. And you know, that Pierce thought to insist on a cameraman does reveal how much he considered the mission to be a political opportunity. Because, I mean, think about it. What economically depressed farmer in Western Australia would ever vote to secede after seeing wonderful footage of a soldier murking an emu with a machine gun, right? That's political gold right there. Meredith and his men set out for the front lines in Campion, confident of success. So confident, in fact, that they left with an order from their comrades in the army's mounted infantry units to collect 100 emu skins to make stylish feathered hats for the officers. And come on, why would they not be confident? Why wouldn't they be able to come home with nice new hats? The Australian army had helped win a world war. So really, what were a few thousand birds? The wheat farmers, George Pierce, Meredith, and his men. They all assumed that the emus would be easy pickings. But on the day they arrived in emu-occupied Campion, massive guns in tow, they had no idea of the painful lesson they were about to learn. That when you assume, you are made an ass by an emu. Of course, you can see why this version of the saying never really caught on, because generally sayings don't require diagrams, but you get the idea. Stuff's gonna get real next episode, I cannot wait for you all to see it. But until we get to release round two, why not check out some Morning Brew? Oh, look at that, I'm a poet and I didn't even realize it. For those not in the know, Morning Brew is an excellent free daily newsletter, Monday through Sunday, that gets you up to speed on the most important news stories of the day in tech, finance, business, and entertainment. Meaning, you're caught up every morning in just five minutes via a witty, irreverent, and informative summary of today's important issues. You know, I've been starting my days with Morning Brew for a few months now, and I gotta tell ya, my mornings have been way more productive and enjoyable than they were before. You know, back during the dark times when I was just doom-scrolling aimlessly through Instagram and Twitter. 
In fact, the other day I learned DoorDash started a food fight with NYC over commission caps. I found out Microsoft is allowing all of their accounts to go passwordless via fingerprint or facial recognition. And I read how the Chinese government is beginning to take aim at the gambling industry in Macau, AKA precisely the mix of news I'm fascinated to read each morning. Again, Morning Brew is completely free, and you can subscribe in about 15 seconds. All you gotta do is click the link in the description below. Then you'll get a piping hot newsletter you can use letter each morning, all while helping to support extra credits in the process without spending a dime. Seriously, thank you all so much for your support. We'll see you next time. That's right, Zoe, Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons.